my mom and I meet often to write and talk about writing and it, we always bring our author stuff, our laptops and our planners and we kind of laughed one day because we both had other planners, which I won't n- mention their brand names, but they're just generic planners that we had tried to adapt vainly for our author life because we also have lives outside of writing. Like I have two young kids, I have a full-time day job, I, I write, I have soccer practices everywhere. I'm a chauffeur, so basically to my children. So I need to have all this and then and having a separate thing for writing just never quite worked. So I wanted to, to merge those two things because I'm not just any one aspect of my life. I am a combination thereof. So. Uh, we kept trying to modify generic planners to merge all the aspects of our lives and it it, and it it was okay it kind of worked but it was like time consuming and it didn't quite meet our needs and um it spent a lot of time for setup so wouldn't it be great if we like if someone just made one and then mom's like why don't we make one and then i'm like why don't we make one and so then we made one so some of the features that it has that you won't find in just a generic planner is that it has these project pages for your projects and it includes a space for your ISBNs, your ASINs, who your cover artist is, when your release date is, what your uh, word count is, a, a little writing progress checklist. Is the first draft written? Is the first draft typed? Have you read through and edited it? Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 280 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with J.C. McKenzie and Joe Ann Carson. J.C. McKenzie is a book-loving, gumboot-wearing, unapologetic science geek. She predominantly writes urban fantasy and post-apocalyptic dystopian fantasy with strong romantic elements. Joanne Carson is an award-winning fantasy author of 31 books who loves the magic of storytelling. She places unique characters in fast-paced plots to tell tales about love, friendship, and family. JC and Joanne and I talk about their writing, the fact that they're um, a mother and daughter team, and the team we're talking about is the collaboration that they've done on the Josie 2023 Planner for Authors. We talk about all those things and more, and that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. What is Findaway Voices, you might ask? Well, I'm going to tell you. I I mean, it's an ad read, so chances are I'm going to tell you about Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that allows you the opportunity to get your audiobooks out into the world. Multiple ways you can do this. You can use their marketplace where you can find a professional narrator on your own, or you can use the more directed project manage uh, version of getting them to find you a narrator from the thousands of narrators they have in their queue and they'll give you various price points usually give you between five and ten options or if you have the audio yourself already like i do because i have found some great narrators uh, some of them through findaway voices and then i basically um, hire them myself i pay them up front and i load the audio books directly to findaway voices now, a couple interesting things you should know about audiobooks is audio is a, uh, um, a a large format. So when you think about print, print is not just one kind of print. There's paperbacks and uh, trade paperbacks, mass markets, which you know indie authors don't have access to actual mass marketishness. You have large prints, you have hardcover, etc. And with audiobook, you can have multiple versions. You can have a straight read. You can have a duet, which is, you know, more than usually two voices, a duet, you know, the, the definition of the word, uh, doing alternating um, 
chapters and voices, oftentimes romance, male, female, that kind of thing. Um, I've been listening to the Michael Connelly uh, series of novels with Renee Ballard and Harry Bosch. And, and again, uh, they've done the last, I think, four books with Renee Ballard and Harry Bosch using the two different narrators to do the voice of Bosch and the voice of Renee Ballard. And I love that, which is why I did that with Lover's Moon. And speaking of which, I have a version of Lover's Moon read by myself and Julie Strauss, the co-author, but I also just loaded this week the professional narrated version. Scott Overton does the voice of Michael Andrews, and Sarah Sampino does the voice of Gail Summers. So yeah, there'll be two versions of that audiobook available, because there's different styles of audiobooks. So you have control. You have choice. And I was able to use Find Away Voices to upload both versions, of course, at different price points because the professionally narrated one is well, it's going to cost a little bit more because, you know, we had to pay for that one. And then the one that Julie and I did was just our time. And because Julie and I are not professional narrators, well, I set the price on that one low. I think it's at $4.99 US or some very reasonable price, whereas the professionally narrated one is going to be $15. So, it's all about choice. It's all about control. It's all about options. And Findaway Voices gives you those options. You can use them for distribution and you can choose one by one of the 43 plus retail and library platforms or you can go all in. They have various promotional opportunities with Chirp Books as well as uh, various other ones. So for example, for the rest of the month of December, I've dropped in the audiobook for A Canadian Werewolf in New York to 99 cents, and it'll be 99 cents on Spotify, on Chirp Books, on Apple, and on uh, Barnes & Noble. I think those are the four platforms. I <laughs> have four platforms that you can set special pricing for, because unlike eBooks, there is no clause in the contracts with the distributors that say they have to be the exact same price. So you can do that. Now, Find A Way Voices puts the power back in your hands as the author. How do you want to get your audiobook out there? How many versions of the audiobook do you want to get out there? Do you want to use them for the services? Do you want to find them yourself? Do you want to just upload your own? You can have it all the ways with Find A Way Voices. And if you want to check out how you can leverage Find A Way Voices as an author, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Okay, for a quick personal update, I am still trying to shake this nasty cough and this congestion, as I'm sure you can still hear in my voice. So, uh, personal update, yeah, it sucks. I hate the fact that I can't get rid of this bloody cough. Uh, but that being said, my voice is a little bit better, and I wanted to get caught up on some comments from recent episodes. So there, there that's my personal update. Uh, I mean, I already shared that I just loaded the lover's moon from sarah and scott i probably have a clip of that at the end credits just you know for fun and, and giggles but uh yeah so let me get to some of the comments from recent episodes so on uh, twitter from a most recent episode uh, episode 279 uh, edwin downward had said reflecting on this week's stark reflections with mark leslie has me thinking about how how when i did the most drafting with my digital voice recorder the funniest part was deciphering that critical piece of prose as a bus or 22-wheeler decided to appear. And uh, thanks for that reflection and, and many of the other reflections, uh, Edwin, that I've missed over the last several episodes. I do love hearing uh, what you guys are reflecting on after you listen to uh, an episode. And yeah, that is obviously one of the challenges, especially when you're out in the wild. Uh, in the wilds of a city and uh, and traffic goes by like what what, what did I just say when <laughs> that horn blared or whatever the case was be uh, but that yeah that's an interesting uh, interesting issue that you're gonna have um, because again when you're recording it just like you'll find in this uh, upcoming episode um, you may miss something and 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 you didn't realize it didn't record it effectively or there was a there was a interference or noise or whatever now I did, uh, for my patrons, I had shared a um, reflection. Uh, I did a read where I just read this article from Mike Shatskin. And then I did a reflection on it. And I'll have a link to the article here in the show notes so you can check out the original article. And I just wanted, for my patrons, I just wanted to read the article and then quickly reflect on my thoughts on it. And so I got some comments uh, that I thought would be interesting to share about that. So you can go check out the article. And, and Stanley B. Trice says, uh, Thanks for your thoughts on this, Mark. I've been listening to excerpts from the trial. Uh, and this was the, the, the trial 
uh, the Department of Justice and, and, and the big publishers, etc. Uh, and that's what the article was about. It was the ruling against uh, Penguin Random House merger, what it means for publishing. That's what the article is about. Sorry, I should have set that up properly. <laughs> so anyway, Stanley says, I've been listening to excerpts from the trial and conclude that we need more readers rather than less or more publishers. Yeah, Stanley, uh, that is true. And and I think the the biggest challenge that we all face, of course, is 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 that there are a lot of readers out there is how do we get our books in front of the exact right readers. And therein lies that thing that we all struggle with constantly. Even when we know who our readers are, how do we get how do we get our stuff in front of them? And that's the age old question about all the things is uh, that 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 element of marketing very specifically. How do I get my book in front of the right people? Oh, yeah, thanks for that, Stanley. Um, and then Maria Stahl said, uh, thanks, Mark. That was really interesting. First of all, hearing the audio of the article was indeed handy. Uh, I, I did, uh, I'd asked uh, my patrons if they liked that. Is this is this valuable to you? Because I want to bring more value to my, my patrons. I mean, I want to bring more value to all my awesome listeners. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll occasionally just do episodes where I, 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 I read something that's out there in detail and then reflect on it. So again, uh, dear listener, do let me know, would that be something uh, that you would find interesting? Maybe those would be a- extra episodes that I can squeeze in because they're probably going to be a lot shorter than the standard interviews. And I do love interviewing and chatting with people. That is a lot of fun because I get to learn from them as well. You see? You see the benefit there? Uh, anyways, Maria said, uh, first of all, hearing the audio of the article was indeed handy. Uh, I did my dishes while listening. <laughs> and then hearing your thoughts on it was enlightening. So yeah, I'd be interested to hear more such content. So thanks for that, Maria. I am going to continue to see how I can do that, both for patrons as well as in general uh, for uh, the regular podcast feed. But do let me know, dear listener, if that's something you'd be interested in. Uh, as well. Um, and then, uh, da, 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 da. oh, so this was, uh, <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, a giveaway for patrons. And I'm going to talk about that at the end after the uh, interview that you hear, because you'll understand what the giveaway is better after you hear about this awesome planner for 2023. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, hint, hint, say no more. I got it wrong for all you Monty Python fans. It's wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, I, well, okay. COVID brain. Yeah, COVID brain. Yeah, that's what I have. <laughs> so say no more. Uh, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, anyways, uh, so uh, this was, um, okay, recent post from Patreon, and um, and, and I neglected to uh, identify who this person was. So, hmm, uh, this person says, I've always used a planner. I started with a bullet journal, but the creative decorating took too much time, although I love the way they look. Now I use a coil-bound agenda to keep track of projects, word count goals, editing deadlines, launch strategies, etc. Very useful. It's amazing how easy it is to lose track of important dates. I realized I didn't book an editorial review for a book coming out in February until I went to put up the pre-order page on Amazon. Sheesh. Sheesh. Well, I can't even pronounce the word sheesh. <laughs> frustrated sigh right that's that's the sound we were going for there <laughs> okay and i just looked it up and that comments over on patreon was from sherry dector hurst writing as sherilyn dector so yeah um I, I guess you talked about um i didn't uh realize you'd booked an editorial review until you went to put up the pre-order page on amazon and so the, i guess having that physical object in front of you allowed you an easy way to see what was going on. Now, I i mean, I use a, a whiteboard for a lot of my stuff. I still have the promo that I just ran uh, on my whiteboard. Uh, and remind me to give you guys the feedback on that in a later future update. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I, um, I did purchase uh, the journal, uh, the planner for 2023 that I talked to JC and Joanne about, and I have it in front of me right now. And I'm looking at it and going, I mean, I'm a little bit intimidated because it's like a lot of work. Uh, but Again, it's the preparatory, preparatory, pre- pre- the yeah, preparatory. Well, we'll, we'll pretend that's uh, the the right word in this situation. You guys are writers. You can you can help me fix that later and fix it in your in your mind as you're editing this while while you're listening, as I'm sure you have to do regularly. But um, it's all that pre planning work uh, that you do that saves you time, and like Sherry says. Uh, you know, can can save you like, oh my God, I forgot I booked that. So again, having it in a single 
uh, a single source that you can easily look at is really important. So thank you guys for uh, those comments. He can leave comments over on, I mean, if Twitter's still around, <laughs> over at Twitter, at Mark Leslie. Um, I'm, I'm still doing things on uh, Twitter. I'm not, I'm not giving up on the platform that I've uh, been on since, uh, I mean, oh my God, the old the old flip phone days, <laughs> the early, early days of Twitter, where you're actually typing messages using the little um, buttons, you know, the letters corresponding to the numbers on your phone. Yeah, yeah, I'm that old. I've been around that long. That's how it started for me. Just like dial-up internet started was the thing I had when I started. Um, you can leave comments there. You can leave comments over at starkreflections.ca. And of course, patrons, you know, uh, comments over at uh, the posts that I leave on Patreon. And I do appreciate hearing your thoughts and your own reflections because that makes this more of an interactive thing for me. And it helps me understand the things that are working well or that are kickstarting certain things in your own creative uh, brain which I absolutely adore. So, uh, like I said, voice is kind of eh, uh, and I'm feeling uh, like, it just it feels like there's just something stuck in my in my nasal uh, passageway. Uh, I can smell and everything, but it just still feels like there's something there. You can hear it in my voice, can't you? But uh, I'm going to stop talking now so we can get into the interview, and I will come back with a reflection, and I will come back with uh, a cool opportunity for my patrons because as I'm recording this on December 8th, you will still have a couple days. You'll still have till December 10th for this great opportunity. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, which may have something to do with the planner that we're talking about. I mean, oh, I'm terrible at keeping a secret, aren't I? Anyways, let's get into the conversation with JC and Joanne. Joanne, JC, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Well, thanks for having us. This is awesome. Yeah, we're very excited to be here. Thank you very much. So before we get into the, the the cool new project, the cool new thing that we're looking at for 2023, I wanted to talk to you guys both about your backgrounds as authors. And I'm going to do this in alphabetical order, just so we know who's coming up by your last name and not the first name, because that's too complicated. <laughs> I can't yeah, do the I was math. Thinking this. <laughs> I can't do the math. <laughs> uh, there's dashes and periods and stuff in there. I just can't do it. I can't. So, so uh, JC, Fair. I'm going to start with you. As a, let, let's get into the background of yourself uh, as a writer, a little bit uh, about yourself and, and how you got into the business. Um, well, I think I was conditioned from a very young age because my mother, who is Joanne Carson, um, has always written um, around the house. She used to write for the newspaper on the uh, Haida Gwaii, and she wrote us our own uh, fairy tale stories that we got to draw pictures to. Um, she's always just embraced being creative and being creative with writing. So that really instilled a love to me for creative writing. Um, and I used to like dabble with it, like making up worlds when I was in high school and I was a bit angsty. So I had like these like dark fantasy like worlds in high school, but I never wrote anything until I came back to Canada from living in New Zealand. And I found myself unemployed for uh, about three months while I was trying to get a job. And um, I just read a lot. That's my coping mechanism when I'm really stressed out. That's my coping mechanism for when I'm really bored. I read and I started having these like really vivid dreams about characters. And I was like, you know, what? I'm going to write this down. So I wrote it down and it was an absolute hot mess. And um, that book <laughs> never saw the light of day uh, for a really long time. And then um, I, I wrote another book because like, I kind of like got kind of the the bug you know like you wanted to write these stories I felt like I needed to now all of a sudden get these stories down I didn't feel comfortable not and ignoring them so I, I wrote another book and then I went and joined a um and I was so proud of myself I finished it and um it was also a hot mess and I went to a writer's group where they just like ripped it apart it wasn't in hindsight, the most constructive writing group to belong to. We were a bunch of amateurs and we didn't know how to constructively criticize books. I was just told to tighten it up all the time. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. And they're like, we don't either. <laughs> and it was like <laughs> one of those things. And so um, that one got uh, pushed to the side too. And then I wrote my my first book that actually got published. It was called Shift Happens. Um, it's part of the Kara series. And I entered it into a bunch of RWA uh, contests for um, non-published authors and it kept winning. And so then I was like, oh, maybe this is 
something that I can go forward on. So I started submitting to publishers, got rejected, like left, right, and center, form three sentence rejection letters. And then I got a response back from the Wild Rose Press saying, hey, we like it, but... And it was basically a revise and resubmit uh, letter. So I did, I revised it. They gave really good constructive feedback and then I resubmitted it and they took it. And so my first uh, seven books uh, were published by the Wild Rose Press. They're a uh, small based, uh, New York based indie press. Uh, and it was, I think for me, the best way to launch into publishing because they take care of everything, right? Like it's, they're not, they're not a vanity press. They're not a big five press, but they are a, a small press that will take care of the cover. They'll take care of the editing and the proofreading and the copy editing and all that. And all I just had to focus on establishing myself as an author. And that was awesome. And then from there, that was in 2014. Um, my son was two and uh, then I just kept writing and then I decided to go indie and um with my next series, which was the uh, Conspiracy of Ravens, uh, the Crawford Investigation series uh, that's set in Vancouver as well. And um, I've been self-publishing ever since. I've, I've, so I'm kind of a hybrid author. I have some traditionally published books and then I'm, I'm indie as well. I love, I love that. One of the things you said earlier was mm -hmm. um, getting uh, one or two lines back from an editor. And, and I actually see that as a positive thing because usually it's a rejection form because they get so many submissions. So yeah. usually when you get them to even a handwrite one or two words, they send back thousands and thousands of submissions. They don't have time to do that. They probably only did that because they thought there was something really good there. Just Oh, thank so you. I, you I, had I, that I tried to tell myself you. that too. Yeah, <laughs> I tried to tell myself that. Like... <laughs> so, um, now you, you, you blame your mom I told uh, you, yeah. for, for this this fault. path this career it's not like this please passion. don't don't do what I do <laughs> I, I just want I just want my child to be happy and not be a writer I'm just teasing <laughs> because that's often what you see right you always want better for your children so now I'm gonna so so Joanne you're you're the you're the genesis of all this trouble and mayhem how did you first get corrupted into becoming a writer I just I love books and I love stories and um, but I didn't have time in my earlier life. So when I retired from teaching, I decided I'm going to do this. And I hooked up with an RWA chapter on Vancouver Island and my world exploded because the all the writers were so helpful and they would share the shirt on their back to help you get to be a better writer. And I entered a lot of contests like Jasmine did. And um it worked well for me. I got good feedback and I got excited about it. And, and uh, you know, 31 books later, I'm not a great, um, huge seller of books, but uh, my audience is steadily growing. I have a platform and I'm thrilled with the writing process. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, you, you said you didn't really start taking it seriously until you retired, but sounds like your home was love of books, love of writing, love of creativity. Yeah, I. It, it's interesting hearing that from Jasmine. I kind of forgot about that, but <laughs> yeah, um, I, I uh, was a teacher of elementary school, and so um, I, I love sharing the the picture books and and you know all Robert Munch and all the stuff that you do, and and so um, yeah, we shared stories a lot. Storytelling is important to me in my life. Yeah, right. Now, did you did you do any? Uh, I mean, so um, can I call you Jasmine? Okay, um, just a quick interruption here. Something weird happened with the audio for a few seconds. Uh, I tried to fix it, I tried to edit it, but wasn't able to. So just letting you know that there will be probably about 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds of bizarre, weirdo audio. Um, but I'll just continue that. Um, and we'll keep going with the conversations and my apologies for the tech issue. I didn't even notice that when we were recording. Um, kind of urban lens and having the super, um, and being able to write locations. I don't often see a representative my new series that's coming out. Canadian grammar, Canadian spelling. I really quite like to include that. And then, um, I have shifted a little bit to, uh, fantasy romance um, or romanticy as it's kind of called and I have done some paranormal romance but I think that I, I'm just always kind of drifting back to urban fantasy and they're all kind of in the supernatural umbrella of stories because um, I think that's what I like that escapism is my yeah I love, I love the fact that you're doing the um, 
uh, the regional stuff that you're you're providing people um, content that said that they can read it and go, I know this place, and it's not New York or Chicago or L.A. or some major American center. So that does, is kind of an inclusive thing, like wanting to make sure you have different kinds of heroes in your story and different perspectives. You're also bringing geography into that. I love that. Yeah, so absolutely. Joanne was was fantasy and paranormal ever a part of your repertoire, or where did you, where did she get this from? Um, <laughs> she has a strong science background, so she got That's really into uh, viruses and things, and it just took off from there. But for me, um, I started with uh, romantic suspense. I thought that I wanted to write something like a James Bond that was female. But I found that the market was so large and so saturated, it was easier to go to shift into more of a paranormal world. So lately, I've been writing about witches, and now I'm writing about funny vampire stories, which I, I quite enjoy. And that, that's newer for you, though, isn't it? That, that um, no, it's most of most of my writing. Is it most? Is it mostly okay? Yeah. So we we blame the love of creativity, the love of passion, but also your penchant for for the paranormal and no you, yeah. you said you've moved more into humor um did, did that sort of come slowly or what was what was the trigger for for getting well, into that I, I i'm not a very funny person in person but well, apparently see. my people find my writing funny and and the more humor i put into it the more positive reviews i get so it's sort of like the i'm getting reflection from my audience and and they enjoy hearing all the vampire uh, puns and and the twists on things and and um we sure need humor right now. <laughs> and now are your vampires also regional? Are they, uh, you know, they have to deal with the um, snow they, and the they cold? They are regional, but it doesn't come out as much, you know? Okay. It's... All right. I, w I wasn't sure, right? Because, uh, I mean, when I when I do paranormal stuff, I um, the, the phase of the moon is very important to me. And I need to know on this day in the city, was it mm -hmm. cloudy? Was it rainy? Was, you know, was the moon visible? What What percentage full was it? So... I imagine that I just wonder with, with vampire stories, you're going to have a lot less sunlight at uh, certain yeah. times of the year in, in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Canada is an ideal place for them to exist. Yeah, you would. So. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and, and the further north you go, you got to be yeah. careful because you well, get the 20 right hours of daylight, right? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But I live in the land oh, yeah. of twilight, right? So. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's and there's true. so much unknown, right? Because we're all huddled close to the border where it's warm. You know, <laughs> the southern part of Canada, most of our population. Um, okay. So um, have you two ever done any uh, fiction collaborating before this, obviously, this this collaboration that we're going to be talking about in a minute? No. No. Really? <laughs> okay. No, I'm just, I was just curious about that. Oh, so, so yeah, obviously each other. We've done that. Yeah. We've, we've critiqued our, our writing. Um, and, and it's a really great process, but also... Joanne is my mom. So when we get to the spicy bits, that's a little awkward. So yeah, yeah, we just imagine. like. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice because if I have, say, just a blurb I want critiqued, I can just shoot it off to Jasmine and she's always willing to, to critique it and send it back. Oh, that's good. You just uh, you just black out the, you redact all the spicy scenes <laughs> either way. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it looks like one of those case files that <laughs> where the government's just blocked this out. It's like, no, no, no. My mom's oh, never been naked gosh. in her life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's let's talk about. So we want you. You guys have a planner for authors. Now, be, before I ask what the planner is, I don't understand what the what the Josie thing is. Is it a combination of your names? Like, where does that come from? Yeah. The Josie twenty twenty three planner. It comes, the Joe comes from Joanne and the Z comes from Mackenzie. So it's the Joe Z planner. There and you then go. you we, got the beginning it, of Joanne's name and then you got the end of your. Well, she was the beginning my, of Genesis uh, and Mayhem, as you said it. I've recorded, <laughs> I am going to keep accusing my mom of being the source of Genesis and Mayhem. It's there like, you go. <laughs> tagline, tagline on her website. Um, <laughs> so where did, where did the Josie, uh, and this is a, a planner for 2023 that's, it went, it's launching now. Is it available now? We're, we're recording this in November, 2022. It, it is, is available, available now. now. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It's available so, on the Vervanti website and also on the Amazon.com and Amazon.ca website. And Vervanti okay. ships internationally everywhere in the world. So awesome. And this is a physical everyone. planner, right? I, it looks like yes. I, I'm, I'm looking at it behind you, Joanne. Yeah. Okay. There it is. <laughs> oh, wait. Let the ideas blossom. 
Ooh. Yes. So it's spiral bound. Yes. This was very important to me because I wanted it to be able to lay flat. You know, when you have a book and you want to lay, like, I don't want to close up on you. I want you to be able to open it, right. lay it flat. And also you can flip it over so you can have just one page available, but you can flip it over. Okay. So I, the spiral bound was a very important feature. So it's a planner. It's a, it's a, it's a planner for the, the year 2023. So obviously it has fixed calendar dates in it, obviously meant to be used obviously for the, for the, that year. I'm, I'm, I see, I see how good I am at understanding titles. But, um, <laughs> can't, can't pull one past me, but um, you got us. <laughs> there is a calendar involved. <laughs> so what is, uh, is it, what's special about this or how is it that this planner is going to actually be a value to authors and I'm assuming it came from you wanting one for yourself right or is this something you guys have been doing for a while yeah well I guess we can start with where the idea came from to kind of help uh set why uh it's so what we feel is valuable to other authors um my mom and I meet often to write and talk about writing and it, we always like bring our author stuff our laptops and our planners and we kind of laughed one day because we both had other planners, which I won't mention their brand names, but they're just generic planners that we had tried to adapt vainly for our author life because we also have lives outside of writing. Like I have two young kids. I have a full-time day job. I, I write. I have like soccer practices everywhere. I'm a chauffeur. So basically to my children. So I need to have all this and then and having a separate thing for writing just never quite worked. So I wanted to to merge those two things because I'm not just any one aspect of my life. I am a combination thereof. So uh, we kept like trying to modify generic planners to merge all the aspects of our lives. And it, it and it, it was okay, it kind of worked, but it was like time consuming and it didn't quite meet our needs. And um, it spent a lot of time for setup. So we were sitting one day and I think, I, I think it was me. So like, yeah, I just, you know, I was thinking like, it, like wouldn't it be great if we like if someone just made one and then mom's like well, why don't we make one and then I'm like why don't we make one and so then we made one and we did a <laughs> two planner for ourselves I, I don't I know I'm kind of have a background so you can't see it but it's um it's dive deep uh for the treasures that you seek and it's mermaid themed and we made it for our, ourselves and we gave a few away to some other author friends That's to get cool. feedback because we put in what we thought would be beneficial to us um mm -hmm. but of course, we're only two indie authors in a vast sea of many indie authors, and we wanted it to appeal to more than just uh, the two of us. So some of the features that it has that you won't find in just a generic planner is that it has these project pages for your projects, and it includes a space for your ISBNs, your ASINs, um, who your cover artist is, when your release date is, what your uh, word count is, um, a, a little writing program checklist is the first draft written is the first draft typed have you read through and edited it um have you sent it to your critique partner slash beta readers um have you sent it to your editor and a proofreader and it has a, a book prep list and a release prep list and my favorite feature is the tracker list because when did I send that to my critique partners and like, when should I be expecting it back? And I, I quite like having that tracker to let me remind me. So I'm not having to go through hundreds of emails to try to figure out. And if you don't use the right search thing, you can't find it. And I just um, really like the tracker side of that. So those pages are very unique to the writing planner. They're very specifically for writing. And then in the month, spreads it also has daily a, a place for daily work counts it has a place for monthly to-do lists i i'm a very anxious person and one of my coping things to deal with my anxiety is to make lists and to just work on one thing at a time and that really helps so this is very much allows that kind of planning um in in the planner so those are the two well, things i know, I know I you I'm... sorry no it's okay i'm sure i missed a bunch of things but yeah no Go no ahead. that was good <laughs> I know you uh, you were holding uh, trying to hold it up and show us and, and obviously with the way that the video has been set up it's not it doesn't working show. <laughs> but I imagine you can probably send a few screenshots that I can post uh, at starkreflections.ca so people can check it out um, Absolutely. so the thing that sounds intriguing here is uh, because you are a chef and a chauffeur and all the things <laughs> as the, the head of the household and doing all the million uh, tasks on top of writing that yeah. the calendar does have space for soccer practice and all the things that 
pull you away from the writing too? <laughs> yeah, that it does. So in the month, that's why we like the, it's eight and a half by 11 and it has a, the months go over two pages. So you can see the whole month and that right. allows you to have a lot of space in that bubble to write down um, everything. I, I don't usually like weekly planners. I find that they, I like to see the whole month out my, myself. So that's what we started with. Um, and because it's not lined, it gives you space to kind of write as much or as little as you want. You can do your highlighting um, across boxes too, if you'd like that. Um, there's many different kinds of organizational styles. So we were trying to leave it open for different styles for people. Yeah. I love that. So you, you've you been using something like this uh, yourself and then got to the point you thought, well, if we like it, <laughs> I, you know, president of the hair club for men over here. Well, if it works for me, <laughs> maybe, maybe other people can benefit from it too. Exactly. So part of it was just like, well, maybe we just set it up and then see how this year goes. We are really proud of the, the product that we've put out. We feel like it's, we're going to love it. And so we're hoping other people will love it too. And um, one thing we're hoping is to get more feedback because then if we do at, like for 2024 and we can make it even better and even more fine tuned for people. Oh, I love that. Oh, it sounds uh, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, dear listener. It sounds like this would be the perfect Christmas gift for a writer to put on your list. And so there will be links uh, <laughs> at starkreflections.ca to um, you said Amazon and, and what was the other place that started with V? Vervanti. So, Vervanti. Yeah, Vervanti. Sounds like a lovely coffee that I'd get at Starbucks yes. or something. Doesn't it? <laughs> Very, it does sound delicious. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's the publisher. Yeah. Oh, Vervanti is the publisher. Okay. okay yeah. I got you. Because they do. And I know, uh, obviously, um, uh, Spiral Bound is, is not a common, not a it's common not... binding type that you can get access to on, on a lot of places. No, we wish that KDP offered that services, but they don't. So we right. we went through Vervanti because they do on-demand printing. We didn't know how successful our first run was going to be. So it's, we didn't want to buy like 600 copies of our planner and only right. sell 10 because it's after the year 2023, it's not useful. So it's yeah. so we wanted to have a, a print-on-demand on printer so that we can... That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's the, 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 the challenge with the dated product is... is Ironically, it's dated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm I'm one of these uh, people. So, you know, early on, starting pre-internet days, getting the writers' market every year, and mm -hmm. highlighting things and all the. Like, yep. I still have, much to the chagrin of my partner, all of the ones from like the '90s. I think I, I think I stopped buying them every year, probably in the mid aughts, because there was an internet. Um, and, and again, you could potentially get market information that wasn't already a year and a half old by the time it was published, but, um, I think I have a 2018 one, if it makes you feel any better, <laughs> there you go. The, uh, and, and again, that was just me because I ended up changing some of the things I was doing, but that I still have those. Cause I can always go back and, and, and it feels like this is, they're nice and thin. So for those who want to go back and say, well, back in 2023, you know, in 2030, as you're a best-selling author and Oprah's interviewing you for her, you know, her reunion <laughs> special or whatever, you can go back and pull the 2023 calendar out and go, yeah, I remember this was the day I got that note from my critique partner and that changed everything or whatever yeah. it was, right? Yeah, we do. Yeah, that's the other reason we picked the eight and a half by 11 size. So if at the end of the year you're done, you have the option of taking out the spiral hole punching it and you can put it in a binder and then you can just start collecting all of them and having it in a binder yes nicely stored yeah oh my god yeah because eight and a half by 11 so you can just keep a nice binder and, and stick a whole bunch of them in there that's fantastic yep. yeah oh i love it you guys you've been planning this for a while when did this first happen the, these ideas uh, last summer was it mom like uh, it was 2021 so we had a yeah. 2022 version which we yeah. did at staples and then okay. um, yeah. <laughs> which was fun shout out to and staples <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so you had a version that you did and then you re revised and refined it and then uh, based on feedback etc right uh, we think we'll be revising every year because we're getting feedback from our friends about what works for them and what doesn't and and i can see us having maybe more than one product in the future too because some people oh yeah alter really alternative versions depending on because it's on demand so you don't have to print ten thousand 
we yeah. don't and and right now like uh, admittedly the style is very feminine featured it's got like flowers it's a purple violet color because my daughter's name is violet and um it's it's got like the you know let the ideas blossom but we're thinking other kind of patterns that are more like gender neutral or just like uh, will appeal to a more a diverse variety of of writers I, I want I want you to do one that's dark and foreboding with skulls and say like I want, I want to crush skulls those too. ideas. I told you, Mom, I want skulls. I know, I know. You've been talking skulls. <laughs> no, Don't that, worry, that skulls is... will be the next one. <laughs> but they'll be they'll be we'll keep the floor. The flowers are quite nice and because and then you know it's a Halloween gift for people because they <laughs> should really start planning their next year out early, right? Not not wait yeah. too late. But and it's not too late even... for those. Who are interested because yeah. this uh, this episode will probably be up in early December of 2022. <laughs> so it's not too late for people to start planning their conquering the world as a writer. Or even if it is early in 2023, you have got 12 months, people. And mm -hmm. there's so much that you can do, even if you're listening to this and it's quarter way to halfway through the year. Uh, I think, uh, again, anytime you make a change, it's never too late, right, to start writing. It's never too late to reorganize and plan things out. What what is it? Uh, what's the retail price for this? And, and and we might have to speak American. I know we're all Canadian here, but you may want to share <laughs> what it would cost to our. I probably have a, a heart larger contingent in Canada on uh, the .ca. It's uh, twenty seven twenty eight. Okay. And of course, if you've got Prime, it's free shipping. Okay. Cool. Awesome. So that means uh, it's going to probably be somewhere in the twenty four ninety nine realm or 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 whatever for uh, American. Uh, I think right. It, for the Amer Amazon.com, it, it's $19.99. And then with the shipping to Canada, it ended up being $29.98 American for me as a Canadian, having it shipped to Canada. So right. for Americans, it's $19.99 US dollars. Oh, cool. And if they have a Prime account, then then that gets them free shipping uh, as well. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. I love that. So um, I'm, I'm curious is how far are each of you into using this planner for next year? Like how deep into 2023 have you already written things into? Um, I've just written my goals so far, like um, what I'm going to write, publish and write, because I, I actually have a bunch of books written, but they still need to go through the rigorous editing process. So they'll right. be published in 2023. But while I'm doing that, I, I work on multiple projects at the same time. I also have goals of what I want to write the first drafts of. Awesome. And then um, that's all I really have planned in 2023 at the at the moment. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm focusing through the, the November, December gauntlet of birthdays and Christmases. Uh, so, yeah, sometimes I delay it until after Christmas to do my 2023 planning. And I put in the book titles and uh, the month titles and sort of sketched in the big picture, but um, no, I haven't done any of the fine, fine stuff. Okay. Are there any tips that you guys would have for an author like, oh, I don't know, uh, um, um, author from Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, who's bald <laughs> and like skulls, you know, just some generic author that, you know, now not should be, shall not be named. A any advice for... Well, how does an author get started if they've never actually used a planner? I think the key is to first pick an organizational structure or planner or system that you want to use. So this is where I drop the not so subtle uh, you know, pitch for our planner, but you need to pick some sort of method. So whether you're going to use an online one or if you're going to use a written one, I like written ones. I like to be able to see everything and not have to flick through screens and stuff and accidentally hit the wrong thing. I, I like the paper version. Um, so you have to, first of all, pick a system, just pick something. And then, um, and you know, you pick ours, pick us, but uh, <laughs> after you pick something, um, it's, it's really important to define what are those foundational pillars of your life? What are the things that you need to focus on? So I, I got my kids and their soccer. I've got my day job stuff. I've got um, my writing stuff. And technically, <clears throat> you know, being healthy and working out and that stuff, which tends to get like pushed to the side because everything else kind of takes over. But that's, you know, health, um, either mental health or physical health, like being active um, and doing that. So those like finding out what's important um, and what is your actual foundational pillars is the first and foremost thing and then mapping those out so like I have soccer practice on this date this time this day this time this day and I put them in and I start with that uh, my day job I don't put in because it's it's very 
straightforward, but my husband's a shift worker. So I um, actually circle the days that he has off because they change every week. So I circle the dates that he is off. That's how I add him in. And I usually assign a color for each of those pillars. This is my system. So it doesn't have to be for you. Um, but like my son is the color green. My daughter is purple. Um, my husband is, um, <laughs> <laughs> you no, I, I think I don't think he gets the color. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, husband. He's, no he's color. He's all the colors. He's all the colors to you. No colors there to you. you go. Blue is my exercise. So if I go for a jog or a run, I highlight it to keep track of how I'm doing because I'm trying to improve upon that aspect of my life. It's something that I struggle to fit in just time wise and energy wise. So I'm trying to track it and I track it with blue. Um, family events are yellow. Uh, and then my own personal things like appointments here and there are pink because it's the only other color in my highlighter that I have left. Um, so I get, I get pink. Um, and so having those things that are so crucial, having them assign a color and then having them across the page is um, generally the, the first steps. And then just adding to it um, from there is my advice. And my advice would be to, to when you start a book, Go to the book page and start filling it in. So you know where you are in the, in the stage of writing and you know where you are in the stage of publishing and you have all the numbers because it, it always seems you need to have the ASIN number when you don't have it and then you spend 10 minutes finding your ASIN number. And it, it goes and you also have to have everything perfect. You have to have, if there's a comma in the title, there has to be a comma in the title for all the platforms you put it on. Um, that kind of detail it uh, can be put down on the book pages and becomes really helpful. It's a really good reference page. I use mine all the time. Like I just have it with me and then I have it open when I'm doing all the KDP stuff or the draft to digital stuff. I have it all there in front of me and it's, it works really well. Yeah. Really helps. Awesome. So uh, last sort of questions are just logistics on, so um, where can people find out more about the planner? I imagine you have a website that will direct people to the places they can purchase them. And, and where can we find out more about each of you and, and the books that you write? You can go ahead, Mom. <laughs> okay. um, we, we don't have a website devoted to it because we both have big author websites on our own. Okay. So um, if you go to either of our websites and go to the Josie Planner, you'll see all the information. So that's joannecarson.com and uh, jcmckenzie.ca. CA. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys both so much for for this very timely interview that I want to make sure I get out as close before the, the next year as possible for, for my authors. Thank you, ladies, so much. Well, thank you so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. Yes, thanks, Mark. Really appreciate it. There are two things, uh, one from uh, something that JC said and uh, one of something that Joanne said. So the first one was when JC talked about writing locations and settings that were not often represented in novels and stories. And, and I think that's so important. When we think about representation, and uh, I'm thinking about things like, I'm just watching the videos of the Little Mermaid and in the, the new version of the Little Mermaid uh, with uh, the black actress who is made and the reaction of little girls who are so excited that hey she looks like me yeah, I know it's a mermaid it's not a human but you know it's a human playing the role and just how valuable that is when 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 people can see themselves represented in um, a movie, a television show, and a book, and just how important that is, um, that inclusion, the diversity. And, and I know this is not necessarily as important as inclusion of uh, people from different walks of life, from different backgrounds, different identities, and uh, different you know, uh, cultural backgrounds, different religions, etc., being represented and, and and you do um i i think that's critical that we do that and this is related again it's not as it maybe isn't as important but it is important when 
you have different locations and 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 again jc's purposely obviously you know p- uh, picking potentially places that she's familiar with so she's writing about those so it's it's not this homogenous piece of fiction that's always set so says the guy who has a series of novels set in new york city but they're not set in major metropolitan centers that they're set in different places and towns where people who read them from different areas can go oh that's familiar i mean i remember and, and this was so critical to me uh, growing up in mid-northern ontario and uh sean costello obviously i mean a good friend of mine now but when I was young and I was growing up and he was releasing these uh, novels through Pocket Books, Eden's Eyes was his very first novel. And, and the opening scene was a murder that took place at uh, a dive bar in Sudbury that we were all familiar with. Uh, I mean, it was, it was a known place. And the fact that it's not a, a dive bar in some bar in some foreign city, but that it was something in our backyard. And in, in a later book, and I remember in Captain Quad, he was uh, there was an accident that happened um, on the, on the train, the slag train. <laughs> so slag would be uh, the molten uh, that they uh, melt, uh, kind of like lava, like that kind of heat, um, to separate the nickel and the ore and the iron and all the things that they get out in unity where I grew up. And there was an accident involving uh, the the slag. So in, in Sudbury, they'd have this train that would uh, run. And, and I remember when I was young, you'd go and park the car and you would watch them at night dump the slag because you saw this you know, like this lava flowing down, down the, you know, like from the side of the highway. And, and you can feel the heat uh, of it as well, because that, that's where they would deposit uh, the slag, you know, after they'd extracted all of the stuff for you know, nickel, iron ore, etc. But anyways, I mean, it just, it was so unique. I mean, yes, I loved Stephen King and stuff, just like Stephen King, right? He brought Dracula to New England, and he did something different. Sean Costello brought the horror right into my own backyard uh, in, in Sudbury, Ontario. And he wrote about Ottawa, which I ended up going to school there, so that was familiar. But I just love the fact that when JC's writing these books, uh, and I got to go check them out because I was checking out her website, and I was like, oh, this is kind of like urban fantasy kind of stuff that I think I would really enjoy. But I, I just love the fact that she's purposely made this effort to write about locations that aren't covered. And and that was in part of the interview, I think, that ended up getting... Uh, um, um, chunk the 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 tape that i was running through my cassette got eaten no i something some weird thing happened i do i knew she was recording this uh from a trailer where the wi-fi and the power and stuff like that that there were some issues with it um but but i think it's important because you know uh whether it's a character whether it's a setting whether it's a situation i think it's really really important that writers continue to open their minds and their hearts uh to to including different things especially if there's something that they're really familiar with and they can write about from a place of authenticity i think that's that's very valuable rather than just deciding to go set it somewhere or deciding i'm going to do this uh doing it with um you know with heart and integrity uh which is the way that she's done this and just that that inclusivity i think is really really important and then the other thing is so joanne joanne said this and I'm, i'm sort of sort of quoting her I was going to go and extract the audio and, and, and have, uh, have it said in her voice because she says it much better. But she basically said, she goes, 31 books later, I'm not a great huge seller of books, but my audience is steadily growing. I have a platform and I'm thrilled with the writing process. I so love, I so love that she said that. Again, she's coming from a place of authenticity, but she is coming from a place of long-term thinking. And, and my heart warms to hear her. So first of all, I have a platform. It's building. Her readership is building. So it's up and to the right. It's going in the right direction. Not in any incredibly ridiculous rate or, or anything like that. And I'm thrilled with the writing process. She loves what she's doing. Her readers love what she's doing. No, she hasn't had a breakaway number one USA Today bestseller title. But she's in it to win it. She's in it for the long run. I'm in a similar boat. I mean, I've been, I was published my first story in 1992. Uh, And how many years? 92 to 30 years ago? Maybe 30 years ago that my very first story uh, was in print. And I've never had a huge breakaway 
best-selling title. What I've done is, I, I mean, yes, I've had some books that have sold, and right now I'm very lucky at how well the Canadian Mounted is selling. Uh, it was obviously it's my top performing book right now, and I've been very pleased with the sales of well, at least a half dozen of my other titles over the last X number of years, but I've never had anything like shoot through the moon. And I know it sounds weird and it sounds bizarre, but I'm actually somewhat grateful that I've never had a ridiculously stupid breakaway bestseller. And I know that people like shake their heads and go, yeah, right, Mark. I think it's important. I've been doing this uh, for over 30 years, 30 years since I first uh, had something published, but I've been doing it for you know, closer to 40 years because I had years and years of rejections. I mean, there wasn't really a self-publishing option back then. But I think the fact that I've never had any one of these ridiculously high bestsellers is critical to my ongoing success, because had I had, uh, let, let's say when, when, when the first version of a Canadian Werewolf in New York came out in 2016, let's say it blew up and I sold hundreds of thousands of copies and it was on the bestseller list in New York Times and USA Today and everything was, was cheeky and, and, and whatever. And then that didn't happen again uh, with the next books that I started to release. I'm compare everything to that. I mean, I had a I had a chirp audiobook deal in January of this year that was phenomenal. And then I had another one in April uh, that was maybe half as good. It was still phenomenal. It was still still like more audiobook sales than, you know, I'd probably see in a 6 to 9 month period all happened in the space of a week. So, my god, it was amazing. But I was comparing it to the other one which was twice as big. And that comparison it actually depressed me a little bit. It actually hit me. And so I think that had I had a breakaway, crazy best-selling title and then just had the regular, slowly, steady scene sales that I've had, um, I, that, that, that would have impacted me in a negative way. Well, Joanne said that I was very, very appreciative. Now, I, did, I had this happen with uh, some of my traditionally published books. So... Uh, Spooky Sedbury was the second of the six books I put out with Dundurn. And and that still probably sold more copies um, than any of my other titles. Uh, I think I'm a Creepy Capital. I have to go back. Creepy Capital is probably the second best selling one. That's Ghost Stories of Ottawa. But and and the and and the last book I did with uh, Dundurn, Macabre Montreal. I mean the last one didn't even uh, didn't even earn out its advance in the first two years. And most of my other books had earned out their advance in the first, you know, six months. Uh, definitely in the first year. I know Spooky Sudbury earned out its in the first month. That's how well it did. But that also coincided with um, uh, Costco <laughs> and sitting there for a full day doing a book signing at Costco where you sell three quarters of a skid. Um, and, and again, I remember how hard it was. How hard it was when the next book, I think Tomes of Terror was my next one. Uh, when the next book came out, and Tomes of Terror did well, it, it did, because it was even available uh, in the States, and I found it on bookstores uh, in the U.S., because it's not just a Canadian location, it's locations in Canada and the U.S., but I remember, even though Tomes of Terror did well, um, I was still having that comparisonitis issue. And, and again, I'm harping on this for a long time, but if you've had any huge success in any one of the things you've done and then gone on to have moderate success or mild success or minor success on anything else, don't discount that minor or moderate success or medium success or whatever it is because it's still success. It's still growth. And so I'm just saying that I'm grateful that I haven't had to deal with that because like Joanne, you know, hey, 31 books, you know, hasn't, you know, had this blockbuster sell, but I'm continually getting new readers. I'm at the, the readership's growing. My platform is growing. And gosh darn it, I love the process. He loves, I'm thrilled with the writing process. I mean, again, talk about, uh, talk about something to, to hear and just feel so amazing for. So Joanne, thank you so much for keeping 
at this, the slow, steady growth that most people, um, that's what it's like. And there's going to be down uh, times when the sales are not so good. And if you're enjoying the process and you're having a good time writing it, that's that's the thing to focus uh, as a writer. Because I know we're going to have those highs and we're going to have those lows. Wow, that was a long reflection. I'm going to take a, a, a breather, take a sip of my coffee here. We'll play a little, uh, we'll play a little sounder, and then I'm going to get into something, uh, something sweet uh, for my patrons. So I want to say a very special thank you to the patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash Stark Reflections. And I want to welcome new patrons, and I'm playing catch up here, <laughs> new patrons to the podcast, uh, uh, Joanne Carson, <laughs> who uh, you've heard her voice in this episode, and uh, Lizbeth Meredith. Um, and actually, Lizbeth was also a guest, I think back in 2021, and, uh, and so obviously I would say there's going to be a link to Joanne's episode, but that's this episode here. Um, uh, but there'll be a link, uh, to Lizbeth's, um, episode, uh, from, uh, 2021. Uh, but I want to say thank you to Joanne and Lizbeth, uh, for joining the patrons and thank you to all of my patrons who support this podcast over at starkreflections.ca. Your patronage, uh, it, it means, uh, and, and like I said, I'm hoping to try to give more back to that patron community. And that being said, um, uh, and my patrons know this already because earlier this week, uh, I posted this to patron, uh, an opportunity for patrons to win. Now I didn't, uh, no, what I normally do is I just do a random draw of all my patrons and, uh, and, and, and just randomly surprise them. And then if they say, no, I'm, it's okay. I don't want it or whatever. Then I pass it on to the next person. So what I did this time is I I created a form that said, hey, if you're interested in the Let Ideas Blossom 2023 Josie Planner, uh, um, fill out the form and just let me know if you're interested uh, in it. Uh, and uh, and I wanted to do this to help my uh, patrons, to give them something really cool, because I have this in my hand. Right now I'm looking at it. It looks like an awesome journal, and I'm looking forward uh, to, to working with it for 2023. And I'll probably be getting started on that in the next few weeks. Uh, but I'm, I'm doing the draw on uh, Sunday the 11th, and I'm going to be uh, drawing four names of the people who say that they're interested in the planner, and I'm going to purchase it for you. I'm going to have it drop shipped from um, Vervante or Amazon or wherever it is uh, directly to you, uh, wherever you are, and I'll let and I'll let the people who won this know uh, on uh, December 11th when I do the random draw from the entries, and want to say uh, thank you, and I hope, and I'm hoping that it gets to you guys in time so you can use this uh, for, for, um, for, you know, 2023, but even if it gets there early in January, I mean, you, you still got a full year to go with. And if, and if you're interested, uh, there will be links of course, to this journal at, uh, in the show notes. So again, a special thanks, uh, to all my patrons and a special thanks, uh, to you, dear listener for listening to the podcast. This has been episode 280 and, uh, next week, if you haven't guessed already, uh, it's going to be two, episode 281. Yeah, I know. It's very sequential. I'm very predictable that way. But I want to say thank you so much for listening. You do not have to become a patron of the podcast, although I do love and appreciate the patrons. Uh, there's a buy me a coffee option as well. There's a link uh, in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. Uh, but otherwise, you can support me as, um, hey, say hi to me when you see me somewhere and say, hey, I listen to your podcast and I enjoy it because, oh my God, you know how you know how much I'm still riding a high from hearing that at 20 Books Vegas, uh, even you know despite getting COVID? there. Uh, I'm, I'm just riding a high and I really appreciate hearing uh, from you guys. I love the reflections you share. I love hearing uh, that you're listening to. It. I love hearing what, what you're thinking about when you listen to the podcast, but you can also leave uh, a review for uh, the podcast on, on whatever podcatcher you happen to be using. So like I said, this is the end of episode 280 until next week and episode 281. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com. 
If this wasn't a strictly professional relationship, she said quietly, we could just take this conversation upstairs to your room, and then we could be as loud as we wanted. I couldn't believe she was so forward. Based on my animal instincts and senses, there was no doubt that she was interested. But she'd shared this was to be a celibate year. I needed to respect that. And besides, I've never been one to make any sort of move when it came to women. Ever. Some alpha male I turned out to be. Yeah, I sighed. Too bad this is strictly professional. Of course, we could always stay here and talk about something else. Like what? Bees. I hear they're all the buzz lately. She groaned and rolled her eyes. Of course, it didn't matter what she did with her eyes. I was hooked like a fish. When she rolled her eyes, my stomach did an outright flip-flop. Good idea, changing the subject. It would allow us to just be friends. <laughs> we both laughed aloud at that, perhaps a bit too loudly. The grumpy couple at the other table turned abruptly, scowling, and made loud tisk noises in our direction. Then they grabbed their drinks and moved to a table farther away from us. Whoa. They looked like they were born to be offended. Should I go apologize to them, I asked? You can take the boy out of Canada, but you can't take the Canada out of the boy. Nah, leave Statler and Waldorf to stew in their misery. I'm glad they buzzed off. You really need to beehive yourself, I said. Wasp on earth are you talking about? I'm sitting here minding my own beeswax. <laughs> we were laughing uncontrollably at the stupidest of jokes and a string of puns that had gone too far a long time ago. But the release of the tension felt incredible. If we hadn't been laughing, I think my head might have exploded. Okay, enough with the bee talk. I think we've combed through all the sweetest puns by this point. She didn't laugh at that. I didn't even get an eye roll. No more bee talk, she agreed. Then a mischievous grin came over her face. Why don't we talk about the birds and the bees? Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. Aren't you? Gail grinned at that reference. Cuckoo could you. I may have been trying to do just that, actually. Her phone vibrated on the table beside her martini. She looked at it, then looked at me. That's Isabeau, isn't it? Yeah. She's checking in to make sure I sleep alone tonight. She's a good friend. She's looking out for you. Yes, she is. She picked up her phone without looking at it and stood up, slipping it into the back pocket of her jeans. The text was perfect timing. We should call it a night. Because if I don't leave now, I swear I will break my vow of chastity all over you like an egg on its way to an omelet. And then I'd have to answer to Isabeau. I stood up. We faced one another. I really enjoy our time together, Gail. Me too. Have a good night, I said, leaning in to give her a hug. She moved into my arms for a warm embrace. I swear I felt intense tingling at every point of contact between us. The hug lasted a full beat, then another. I wasn't willing to let her go just yet, and I squeezed a little harder. Breathing in the combination of the sandalwood and vanilla scent of her hair this close hypnotized me. Feeling her against me was even better than I had imagined, and I had imagined it a hell of a lot in the past several days. She didn't let go either. Her own arms tightened a bit more. Another beat passed. This is nice. It is. See? A nice hug. Chastity intact. It's all good. I could stay like this all night. Me too. It's perfect. Yeah. Except there's this one problem. What's that? Are you sure you're Canadian? Why? Because I didn't think Canadians carried guns. What? I started to pull back from her, confused. She let out a giggle and reached down with one hand on the back of my ass and pulled me back in tight against her so my hardness pressed against her thigh. Oh, I said, yeah, that. I am always happy to see you. Ecstatic, even. Oh, don't worry. I can tell. But you know what would make me happy? Perhaps even ecstatic? Tell me, I whispered into her ear a little more forcefully than I had intended. She pulled her head back and looked up in my eyes, her breath hot on the top of my throat. If I could stop wondering what it would feel like to kiss you. <laughs>